Okay, as I mentioned, uh, the finance minister, Christia Freeland, introducing her legislation to increase the capital gains inclusion rate to, from 50% to 75%. Of course, it only kicks in if you have a capital gain of more than a quarter of a million dollars in any one year. Our guest is among those in the business community who is critical. Uh, he's disappointed. We're joined by Mike Vinegar, portfolio manager at MV Wealth Partners with IA Private Wealth. You don't think this is a good idea? I don't. Uh... Canada already has a productivity problem. Uh, on top of that, if you're a small business person, whether you're an entrepreneur or even a mid-sized business person, our capital markets are already small and there's not a lot of choice to go raise capital. Mm -hmm. By increasing the capital gains inclusion rate, specifically from trusts and corporate accounts, let alone personal accounts when they exceed a $250,000 annual capital gain, at the margin, you're taking away that potential idle capital that could go into the primary market and help fund private equity, new, new company formation, new issues on the market. Um, so I, I kind of feel like this was an attack on the quote unquote wealthy without a consequence for how that may impact the capital formation of our country and entrepreneurialism and new jobs. Mm -hmm. What about somebody, though, selling a cottage and they're going to have to pay a bigger tax hit? I mean, that, you know, it's only a minority of Canadians can afford a second home. That's right. And, you know, a lot of Canadians, I think, may have inherited those cottages. So maybe they weren't inherently wealthy to begin with. This was passed down from a prior generation. It didn't cost them anything on the inheritance. Now they've owned it for a while. And now all of a sudden, if they're going to make a decision to either sell it because perhaps their children may not want the cottage, mm -hmm. all of a sudden that's just that much more tax to pay. Well, some people might say, tough beans. You didn't work for it. That is true. But, but again, at the end of the day, uh, this is yet another way for our government to reclaim more money when that money could be potentially put to more productive uses and benefit everybody in the economy. Certainly our government, well, the Globe and Mail has detailed government secrecy in Canada. So when it comes to the government being accountable to the people of Canada, um, and it's not the first government to be like this, but you know, they spend and they spend. I don't know how accountable they are. Right. Uh, again, uh, you know, our tax system, and we can debate on yeah. and on, and I'm sure there's many different viewpoints on, you know, how best to tax the economy, the mm -hmm. GDP, to make it more fair for everybody. But I think when there's been so much noise in the media about productivity, about capital formation, about the growth in GDP versus our partners from the South, um, is this the best way to, for lack of a better word, suck out liquidity that could otherwise be used for more issuance of securities and potentially grease the wheels of the economy and the entrepreneurial spirit? Talk to us about oil. Are you overweight right now in your portfolios in oil stocks? Uh, actually, we're not overweight. Um, there's a seasonal tendency for oil stocks to typically peak in May. Oh. Um, so we did actually take some profit off the table back in April and May for some of our oil and gas positions that went up. Um, having said that, uh, we are seeing some strength in the last few days, though I wouldn't be surprised to see the price of oil go down, not for any other reason, just for seasonal pattern purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the shoulder season when, generally speaking, all the oil refiners have already switched from their winter uh, gasoline to summer gasoline and, and all of that changeover. And they've more than likely bought a lot of the... Uh, inputs that they need. Plus, you're seeing builds in the U.S. specifically, but in other nations of oil. And the other thing that I'm kind of thinking about is when OPEC had their meeting last week, if you read between the lines, it seems to me like there's about five to six million barrels a day of spare capacity. Mm. Now, whether you believe that it's six or maybe it's a little less than six, call it four, the reality is that it's not that tight. So there is a reason to believe that the current price of oil is a little bit too high given the geopolitical 
uh, goings on around the world, whether it's the political um, uh, theater, and rather the uh, war theater in Ukraine, mm -hmm. or the uh, stuff going on in the Middle East. Um, just fine. We got some index changes um, in the states. Uh, CrowdStrike and KKR um, getting moved up in the index standings. Um, you, you can see a temporary pop when the index buyers come in with these names, but is it an important development? I don't think so. Um, there's nothing that changes fundamentally with those businesses. So what did the people, the shareholders that own these stocks last Friday or Thursday not know that they yeah. now know? Uh, to my knowledge, unless there's been a uh, drastic change in the business, the valuation of the enterprise has not changed. But for the next few weeks and until that inclusion date, which I think happens in two weeks or so, uh, there is going to be a rush from a whole bunch of mm -hmm. fundamental uh, managers, ETF providers that must own these securities because they track the various indices that they're going to be included in.